Okay, welcome everyone today uh, to today's uh, webinar. Uh, and I'm very pleased to have Dr. Mauro Saig here. Um, Dr. Saig is an Associate Professor of Pathology at the Santa Casa Medical School and Head of Cytopathology at the AC Camargo Cancer Center in Sao Paulo, Brazil. He is actively involved in research in graduate and postgraduate teaching, having presented several courses at both national and international meetings, such as the American Society of Cytopathology Annual Meeting, the European Congress of Cytology, and the International Academy of Cytology. He currently serves as the Vice President of the Brazilian Society of Cytopathology, the Scientific Director of the Latin American Society of Cytopathology, and is a member of committees for both the Papa Nicolau Society of Cytopathology and the American Society of Cytopathology. Um, and on a personal note, he's, he's also a great guy. So we're, we're very glad to have him here. And with no further ado, I will turn the session over to him. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I would like to thank the Academy too for uh, inviting me to uh, present this webinar. It's such a prestigious uh, panel of uh, sessions and lectures, and it's a great honor to be part of that. And uh, today I would like to talk to you about the benefits of rows in head and neck cytology, and it's going to be a case-based approach. So basically, it's not, I'm not going to talk uh, a lot about any specific entity of head and neck cytopathology. And I'm just going to mention how the use of retinal site evaluation can help us on our everyday uh, practice for us to make a better diagnosis in cytology and to uh, make cytology a true definite uh, diagnostic technique uh, yielding a precise diagnosis. So rapid on-site assessment, rapid on-site evaluation, uh, there is a clear benefit for adequate pre-analytical control of specimens, and it surely saves and manages material from minimally invasive techniques. So the important thing about ROSE is that it helps us achieve a better material with our FNA samples. So the main critics we get from our fellow pathologists and even for clinicians is that cytopathology doesn't yield a very definite diagnosis many of the times that we have to appeal for a core biopsy or surgical excision to give us a final diagnosis. And with ROSE, we have a very good chance of having an, an adequate, fine pre-analytical control of this material. And with that, we can provide detailed, accurate diagnosis and we can spare some material for ancillary studies for molecular analysis. And this is gonna help us a lot because it's gonna determine a real shift of cytology from being basically screening, whether it's positive or negative, whether it's benign or malignant, to really diagnostic. We're gonna give a final diagnosis, it's gonna be precise. We're gonna have material for molecular, we're gonna have material for immuno, we're gonna be able to use that material from the patient yielding from a minimally invasive approach for guiding therapy, for molecular target therapy, for better management, for better prognosis. This is, so, this is what cytology should be all about in the 21st century. So uh, just a little bit of the place where I work at. Uh, so I'm currently here at the AC Camargo Cancer Center. It's the largest cancer center in Latin America. It's situated uh, in Sao Paulo, which is the largest city in South America. Uh, there's one main hospital and there's three daycare hospitals with satellite diagnostic centers and we perform fine needle aspirations on both the primary institution and also the satellite institutions and we perform roles for all our FNAs. We are currently installing the telepathology service so we're going to be able to uh, look at the specimens from these different institutions and be performing uh, the rapid on-site evaluation for all of our FNAs. Uh, we do uh, serve both public and private uh, practice. It's mainly private, but also there is a, a little bit of public uh, healthcare system also in our, our hospitals. So this is our rapid on-site evaluation office. This is where we stay uh, inside the ultrasound suite. So as a matter of fact, we have the ultrasound department, the radiology department, and this is our room. Uh, within the, the radiology department, we have a three hat microscope where the resident is and also a technician. And what we do basically is that we have shifts with uh, always a cytopathologist on shift for rapid on site evaluation. And we sign out cases with the resident. And in the meantime, while we are signing out uh, cases with the resident, the FNAs come in and we go to the uh, ultrasound suites. We manage all the material. I'm going to show you to you how we do it. And then we come, we stain with DIFQUIC, we look at the slides, we interact with the clinicians, we interact with the radiologists, 
and we give them a first overall impression upon rolls. And depending on that impression, we perform an additional FNA. We save material for cell block. We save material for molecular. We set it for flow cytometry or whatever technique we might think is suitable uh, for that specific diagnosis. So this is the other part of the office where we have the sink and the staining kit. And we have all we need for uh, additional ancillary studies. So if we want to put in formaldehyde, if we want to send some material for flow cytometry, if we want to put it in liquid-based preparations, for example, we just do it up there. And then from there, we send uh, the material to the lab. So this is basically our main station for performing rapid on-site evaluation. Uh, this is one example of how we do it, basically. This is one example of an ultrasound-guided uh, FNA of uh, EUS, so it was a pancreatic lesion, if I'm not mistaken. So just for you to have an idea of how we do it. So uh, as I was telling you, we have this room, uh, this office for rapid on-site evaluation that is within the ultrasound department, but we also serve all the uh, areas from diagnostic centers, so we are often called on endoscopy and CT guided FNAs and uh, and also all of these uh, specimens come to us and then we have to perform uh, analysis for all of our samples. So this one, for example, is from a endoscopy ultrasound guided FNA. Um, so basically what we do is we put all material into one slide and then we try to separate whatever is blood from whatever is tissue. That's very important, as I always tell my residents, they get very happy when they enter the cytology rotation because they say they're not going to have to do gross analysis anymore. And I often tell them, no, you have to. As a matter of fact, in cytology, we will also do gross analysis. It's a little bit more simple and more um, e easy looking at that. But it's basically you just put all the material into the slide and then you have to separate whether you think that is tissue from what you think it's blood. And this is very important because you're going to be able to separate tissue and smear only what looks like tissue and not what looks like blood. This prevents you from having 15 smears of blood and one smear that has material, or sometimes you just have all of your smears contaminated with lots of blood and you form clots and you can see whatever cells are uh, below that clot and you lose material and you have to perform a second pass or ask for a second pass and then you say, oh, but I, I was sure I wasn't a nodule, and then you, you get in conflict with the radiologist because they think that you couldn't see any cells. As a matter of fact, you didn't separate well what was tissue and what was blood. So that is one basic step that I always do, especially for uh, endoscopy-guided FNAs, which I really think it's uh, very useful. So with the gross analysis, even when you perform a smear and you take a look at the smear without staining, you know if you have material or not. So this, for example, is uh, one FNA of an auxiliary lymph node. A patient had a, a previous history of metastatic of uh, ductal adenocarcinoma of the breast. And here you can see that we have the smear and you have this large chunks of tissue. Uh, even without staining, I'm sure there is material there. I'm sure there is tissue and it's probably metastatic. And when I stain that and I look at that, I can see that with the diff quick, I see the little chunks of tissue uh, within the material. And I can see that uh, it's uh, probably positive. When I zoom in, and this is not with the microscope, this is just with the camera, uh, I can see the large chunks of groups kind of uh, clustered together. And I believe those are epithelial cells. And when we look closer, we can see they are really epithelial cells and it's a metastatic duct ductal carcinoma of the breast to the lymph node. So gross analysis, it's really important. It's gonna give you a clue if that material is diagnostic or not. I'm sure that those of you who perform FNA on a regular basis are very familiar, for example, with pleomorphic adenoma. Once you smear material from pleomorphic adenoma, you know it's a pleomorphic adenoma just by the way you smear the material and the way it's uh, connected to the slide and it's glued to the slide. And once you stain it and you have this beautiful magenta look at it, you know, it's pleomorphic adenoma. So gross analysis is a very important part of our cytology uh, everyday routine. So this is basically what we stand for for the rapid site evaluation algorithm. So uh, in here you can see that when we start, we put the material in the uh, on the slide and then we perform smears. I usually stain half of my smears for diff quick 
and half of my steers I uh, fix it in um, ethanol in alcohol for uh, further processing with uh, pap smear. And then I look at the diff quick stains and depending on my primary diagnosis, my primary impression, then I just separate the material for all of the other things. So if I think it might be a lymphoma, I just have material for flow cytometry. If I think it might be uh, in useful of some molecular studies, I can save some in uh, FTA cards and I can perform a cell block for later molecular analysis. If I think that I might use immunostochemistry, for example, I also save it for cell block and then I put some uh, of this material and then I perform, sometimes I perform a second pass to be sure I have high quality material and I process it in formaldehyde and then uh, with a cell block for later staining with AGE and use of immunohistochemistry. Whenever I think there is an infectious disease, I just set it for microbiology and PCR. And sometimes I also save it in liquid based preparations, especially when it's cystic or it's very hemorrhagic. And of course, with liquid based preparation, we can always use it for immunohistochemistry and also molecular studies such as fish. So this, this is basically the algorithm that we use for rapid on-site evaluation, and this is how we separate the material in order to have a final diagnosis in all cases. So uh, I'm pretty sure that when you have a very good pre-analytical control, when you take good, very, very good take care of your material, you're going to be able to separate that material accordingly and use that material wisely, because we usually have very little material uh, not many cells, and we have to use it wisely in order to uh, yield a proper and definite diagnosis that is going to help manage the patient and, of course, impact on patient therapy. And what I intend to do now is to present to you some cases of how rapid onset evaluation has changed the final diagnosis of head and neck lesions and how the use of rapid onset evaluation with the uh, a uh, very delicate pre-analytical control of the specimen has yielded us with a very good material that in the end uh, gave us a final definite diagnosis and sometimes changed the whole management of the patient before the FNA procedure. So the first case is a boy, he was seven years old. Uh, he presented with a hypoechoic nodule in the thyroid with microclassifications. As a matter of fact, it was classified with uh, ACR tyreds 5, which is very suspicious for uh, malignant neoplasma. The clinician had a very strong suspicion for papillary thyroid carcinoma and had already warned the family. I was very uh, anxious when I performed the FNA because uh, the parents were together with the boy and they were almost crying, uh, and they were sure their uh, child had a papillary carcinoma and had to perform a surgery. So this is the ultrasound that you can see a nodule that is, uh, you have these areas that are hyperechoic that looks like a microclassification, some hyperechoic areas, kind of irregular in the thyroid of a seven year old, pretty sure it demands an FNA and they were afraid it would be a, a papillary carcinoma. And when we looked at the smears, what we saw were lymphocytes. So in here you have some uh, very degree of heterogeneity. So you can see that we have some small kind mature looking lymphocytes and some other that are a little bit larger with some cytoplasm resembling centroblasts. So there's a, a little bit of um, portion of immature cells and uh, the majority of them were mature. Uh, in here again with a pap smear, it wasn't very cellular. It was scantily cellular, but we could see some uh, in centroblast looking cell or centrocyte looking cells with some cells that look like mature uh, lymphocytes in a hemorrhagic background, some capillaries in the background. And then we thought, hmm, it doesn't look like papillary thyroid carcinoma, there's not epithelial, it's a lymphoid proliferation. So our rose impression was, yeah, maybe this is a reactive lymphoid population, could it be a possible thyroiditis? But there was no thyroid malfunction. There was no change in thyroid parenchyma. It was a solitary nodule in this, in this patient. Any additional possibilities would compromise, for example, a lymphoma of the thyroid, which is rare, but it might be, but it's a seven-year-old boy. We, 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 we hoped it wouldn't be, and then we decided to send the material for full cytometry, and we had one additional idea about this. And when we looked at the flow cytometry, you can see here that the whole 
uh, spectrum of maturation. So we have some immature T cells, cortical T cells were the majority of the population, and also some mature T cells. And this phenotype was very characteristic of a thymic population. So as a matter of fact, it turned out to be an intrathyroidal thymus. So we concluded as negative thermoluminosity compatible with intrathyroidal ectopic thymus. And this is where rose helped us a lot because this is most commonly seen in children. It may be mistaken for suspicious nodules because they have this uh, irregular appearance sometimes with uh, uh, areas of hyperechoic punctuates that look like microcalcifications. It could be mistaken for papillary thyroid carcinoma. And of course, the correct interpretation may spare unnecessary surgery. So there's need for full cytometry. It's almost impossible to make that diagnosis on cytological grounds alone. It could be suspicious of intrathyroidal thymus, and I've seen some. So when I saw those cells, I thought mm, it might be an intrathyroidal thymus in a child. We have to send it for flow. And some immature lymphocytes are usually seen, though it's impossible to rule out a lymphoma on cytological grounds alone. So it's very important to perform most to set it for flow cytometry and be sure that we are uh, giving a proper definite diagnosis. So in this case, for example, with ROSE, we had a diagnosis of intrathyroidal ectopic thymus. Without ROSE, we would have a diagnosis of lymphocytic proliferation, C note, and then we would say that it may represent focal thyroiditis, even a low-grade lymphoma, or intrathyroidal thymus. So uh, we weren't sure of the right diagnosis, and yes, with ROSE, we could give a proper, definite diagnosis. This is uh, the importance of performing rapid onset evaluation for all specimens, including thyroid specimens, when uh, something unusual shows up. So in this case, particularly, ROSE defined a precise diagnosis and spared uh, unnecessary thyroid surgery. I remember that when I told the parents that it was an intrathyroid thymus, they started crying and they were very happy. And they, and they thanked us all because they thought that the patient had a malignant neoplasm and in the end it turned out to be just an ectopic thymus. So, uh, of course, this was helped by ROSE because without ROSE, uh, we would have uh, indefinite diagnosis and the patient would probably either go to a surgery or follow up the nodule and have a second FNA, which was unnecessary. Our second case is a female, uh, 79 years old, uh, that presented with a nodular lesion in the thyroid gland measuring 3.4, uh, uh, 2.2 centimeters. And, he present, and she had a history of a previous melanoma of the scalp. And then we went on and we performed the FNA of the thyroid gland. And this is what we saw. So this is the pap smear. Uh, you can see some uh, large population of cells. The cells look somewhat atypical, but kind of monomorphic in appearance. Uh, they are scattered. Some of them are isolated. Some of them are uh, in kind of discohesive group. And sometimes you can see a little bit of molding within the cells. Here you have the diff quick image again, uh, showing that nuclear chromatin is somewhat irregular. Cells are uh, disposed in uh, with this mounting artifact, and here there is a Apache background. Uh, you can see something that resembles a paranuclear blue body here, and the chromatin some, looks somewhat irregular in the diff quick as well. This is the PAP showing the typical sudden pepper chromatin that is seen in neurodegenerative neoplasms, and here again molding, and here again molding. And these cells are small with scant cytoplasm and uh, some atypia. There were some mitosis uh, happening on and off. Here again molding, and this typical sudden pepper chromatin of the nuclei. Remember, the patient had a previous history of a melanoma in the scalp. So our rose impression was that it was a neoplastic proliferation of small blue round cells. So we, we thought it would be a small blue round tumor. Could it be a poorly differentiated carcinoma? Yes, of course it could be. We all know that poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas of the parotid gland usually have this appearance. It could be a small cell carcinoma. 
Uh, yes, it should be neuroendocrine because the nuclei are very characteristic. Would there be any association with the previous clinical history of melanoma? Yes, it's always a possibility. You know, melanoma is a great mimicker, so it can mimic anything. So it might be a metastatic melanoma. Who knows? Uh, it doesn't resemble, we don't have the large cherry uh, nucleoli. I couldn't see any binucleation, any, I couldn't see any pigment. There wasn't any clear evidence it was a melanoma, but yes, uh, it, it's impossible to rule it out. So we uh, had to perform a cell block. So our decision for Rose was let's put it in formaldehyde and let's perform a cell block for that. And uh, when they looked at the cell block, the characteristics of the cell block were usually uh, were very similar. So we had small uh, blue round cells that looked very uniform in appearance uh, with mild atypia. They were uh, clustered in groups with some molding and the nuclei remained with a salt and pepper type chromatin. And I'm just going to show you the positive markers. Uh, it was positive for synaptophysin. Clearly, strongly, diffusely positive. It was positive for CD56, very diffusely, strongly positive. And there was a CK20 dot like positivity and, uh, in the cytoplasm that is very characteristic of Merkel cell carcinoma. So, our conclusion it was negative for all the melanoma markers. So, our conclusion is that it was a poorly differentiated small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, Merkel type. But then we thought, well, the patient had a history of a scalp melanoma, so maybe it was a second tumor. So uh, she presented with a scalp melanoma, and then she had the Merkel uh, carcinoma of the parotid gland. Although it's rare to have a primary uh, Merkel of the parotid gland, it could be, or the patient may be another Merkel carcinoma of the skin metastatic to the parotid gland, and we had to look at that. But then we went on and we revealed the primary diagnosis. It was an external diagnosis without immuno. We revealed that it was morphologically very similar to our case with small cells. The previous diagnosis was of a melanoma, and then we repeated immuno reactions and we confirmed that it was indeed a Merkel cell tumor of the skin, and this was a metastatic Merkel cell tumor to the parotid gland. So in here, uh, it was very important the use of robots because not only we had a definite, proper diagnosis in cytology, we also were able to change the primary diagnosis of the patient and completely change better and provide better management for that patient. So Merkel cell tumor is much more common, by far, presenting as a mass in the parotid gland than a primary neoplasm. It's usually seen in older patients. There is a poor prognosis, especially when it's metastatic to the parotid gland. And differential melanoma may occur, especially if it's a small cell melanoma. But immunohistochemistry is usually straightforward and very uh, contributory. So neuroendocrine markers are going to be positive for Merkel cell. It's going to be S100 negative. All the other melanoma markers are usually negative. And there is the classical CK20 dot like positivity that it was seen, uh, for example, in this case. So again, for this case, uh, case two, our final diagnosis with Rose was, it was a metastatic Merkel cell carcinoma from previously skin lesion, presumably diagnosed as melanoma, but it was actually a Merkel cell neoplasm. And without Rose, we would have signed it out as poorly differentiated small cell neoplasm, is it primary? Is it metastatic? We don't know. So yes, again, we had roles helped us define and give us a proper definite diagnosis. So in this case, roles defined a precise diagnosis, helped us to revise the original diagnosis, and of course, there was a better patient management. So the patient presumably had a melanoma. It was treated as a melanoma, and now he's been treated. Uh, she, as a matter of fact, is being treated as a Merkel cell neoplasm with metastatic uh, neoplasma to the parotid gland. Case number three. Uh, so case number three is a female, 34 years old. Uh, the patient presented with a hypoechoic nodule in the inferior third of the right thyroid lobe. It was classified as ACR tyreds 4. And she had a familial history of carcinoma of the thyroid. So she was very worried because she presented with this hypoechoic nodule and uh, she thought that it could be a potential um, thyroid carcinoma and she was young and she wanted to get her out of this way because she had a familiar history of carcinoma. 
So we performed the FNA of the nodule, and when we uh, looked at the FNA of the nodule, it looked a little bit curious, uh, to say the least, because we could see that most of the cells had this microfollicular appearance, and some were clustered in solid patterns. And what was very uh, straightforward in this case, that we could see a very rich capillary meshwork within these solid nests of cells. So we could see the cells, there wasn't too much ATP, so we didn't raise us the, uh, uh, the issue for a classical uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma, for example, but we could see that many cells had this microfollicular patterns and some cells have this large chunks of solid uh, groups. Here again, we can see the solid groups of cells, some forming a somewhat microfollicular pattern with this capillary branch looking stroma. So it's a very highly vascularized stroma uh, where the cells are within the cells. And also you can see some scattered uh, cells isolated, just like naked nuclei in the background. Again, uh, you can see that atypia is not very uh, straightforward, so it's not very atypical. Some cells do look like they have this microfollicular patterns. Uh, in here, there is some solid nests of cells. Some cells are isolated with this naked nuclei appearance, and, and uh, there's not too much ATP. Again, for the diff quick, some solid cells. It doesn't remind us of papillary thyroid carcinoma, but it could definitely be a, a follicular neoplasm. There's some microfollicular architecture, some solid nests. Yes, it could be. One thing that is striking uh, interesting about this case is that it's uh, based on a capillary, very rich vascularized uh, meshwork. I don't see any areas that could resemble curve of differentiation. These cells, for example, have some plasmacytoid appearance, but there is no prominent nuclei, there is no binucleation. Medullary carcinoma, yes, usually medullary carcinoma presents with uh, higher degrees of ATP, but I don't see any uh, nuclei that are characteristic with salt and pepper chromatin, as we saw in the previous case. So um, I'm not very sure of that, too. Uh, for the pap smear, you can also see the solid nests of cell and some scattered isolated cells in the background with the naked nuclei that are very commonly seen in this case. And again, in here, uh, we can also see the capillary meshwork, the very rich vascularized stroma where the cells are deposited. So it is a very large uh, population of cells that look uh, like they are organized in uh, solid cells or nests or trabecula, sometimes exhibiting a microfollicular pattern in a rich vascularized stroma with minimal atypia and uh, some scattered isolated cells. Here again, just showing the detail of the rich vascularized stroma where the cells are deposited. So our rose impression was it was a proliferation of epithelial cells, occasional microfollicular architecture. It was highly vascularized. Possible differentials. I think the InfoFast hurdle cell neoplasm, yes, but I I didn't see any uh, large uh, nucleoli that are very characteristic of fertile cell neoplasms. I couldn't see uh, binucleation. There wasn't a very clear oncocytic characteristic of the lesion. Could be flus, suspicious for follicular neoplasm, yes. It could be a thyroid lesion that's mainly composed of microfollicles. We would have to be uh, double check on that, but yeah, it's a possibility. Medullary carcinoma, I think it would be a slightly less probable idea, but we always have to rule it out. And parathyroidal lesion, that's a very good idea. Some scattered isolated cells, some cells that resemble a microfollicular pattern, very richly vascularized. But again, parathyroidal lesions are very difficult to diagnose on cytological grounds alone. So with that in mind, it's very important for us to perform a cell block. And we went ahead, we performed the cell block, and in the cell block we saw again the cells that have very uh, scant or minimal ATP. They are again organized in microfollicles and trabeculas. You can see here that you have the microfollicles and trabeculas, and you have some uh, capillaries within the cells of 
uh, nests of epithelial cells that also adhere to this idea that this tumor is highly vascularized. And when we performed immunohistochemistry, chemistry it was diffusely positive for PTH, so it was uh, confirmatory of a parathyroidal lesion. So this was only possible because of rose. It was only possible because we performed a cell block, and we don't usually perform cell blocks for thyroid on our routine practice. So uh, thinking that it did, didn't look like a regular everyday looking thyroidal lesion, that it might be something else. We work in a cancer center, so sometimes you always think of metastatic lesions in the thyroid as well. And when we look at something that doesn't really fit into what we see every day for thyroid, it's not uncommon for us to perform a cell block and do some immunos things to be sure that we are looking at uh, thyroid tissue. And in this case, it was a parathyroidal lesion. So uh, surgical excision of the lesion was uh, performed and it reviewed a uh, parathyroidal adenoma. So parathyroidal lesions are very difficult to diagnose on cytological grounds alone. They may mimic microfollicular lesions of the thyroid, uh, the differential with hurdle cell neoplasms, and even medullary carcinomas might occur. And some clues that they are highly vascularized, as you can see in those cases, there were some scattered isolated cells. And of course, uh, it's impossible, it's virtually impossible for you to diagnose that on cytological grounds alone. So you need immunosochemistry or uh, even the uh, measure the level of PDH, uh, rings needle wash. And this is another thing that we did for this case. It was highly elevated. So uh, it gave us a definite diagnosis of uh, parathyroidal lesions. So with Rose, in this case, we had a final diagnosis of a parathyroidal lesion that led to a diagnosis of adenoma in the surgical resection. And without Rose, we would have cited out a suspicious trifollicular neoplasm, C note, and we would say, note, differential diagnosis include nodular hyperplasia, liquid neoplasms, hurdle cell lesions, and parathyroidal lesions. So, of course, we have a mass, a vast majority of differential diagnosis. And we, want, we don't want to give the patient that. We want to give the anxiety to the patient and say, well, I don't, we don't know what you have. It might be a malignant neoplasm. It might be a benign neoplasm. It might be a parathyroidal lesion. So... Uh, we have to perform a second FNA, or maybe you would have to go to surgery and remove the nodule for you to be sure that it's not malignant. And with Rose, we were sure that it was parathyroidal lesion, and the patient went on, removed the lesion, it was an adenoma. So it's very important for us to be assertive, to know that we have a final, definite, proper diagnosis. This is very important for uh, the use of cytology and uh, saying that cytology is really definite for our final diagnosis. So in this case, Rose defined a precise diagnosis, and of course, uh, you did a better patient management because the patient could be properly managed and uh, the thyroid wasn't removed. Case number four, uh, it's a case of a male, 73 years old. Uh, he presented with an nodule in the scalp, and there was no previous history. The only thing is that he was a heavy smoker. So this is the uh, image from the FNA lesion of the skull. So in here, you can see some cells that are arranged in solid mass, sometimes three-dimensional. Uh, you can see that the cells have a large vacuolated cytoplasm with this foamy uh, vacuoles in the cytoplasm. They have a highly vascularized as well stroma. So we have this rich branching capillaries. And it looks like the cells are branching, are arborized from these uh, capillaries here. And you have the cells that don't have much ATP. I would say the ATP is mild. Some binucleation, some very large cytoplasm with a foamy, vacuolated appearance that look to me a little bit uh, oncocytic. Again, here, uh, we can see that some, there's some binucleation. Uh, some cells exhibit very prominent nucleoli. There is a large cytoplasm, foamy, bubbly cytoplasm. Uh, here, you can see some endothelial cells. So there's clearly a very rich uh, capillary meshwork within the cells. Some binucleation, prominent nucleoli. Here, you can see better in the pap smear that we have this capillary now within the groups of cells and the groups of cells branch from capillaries and in here we have uh, 
prominent nucleoli and these large cells with a moderate or a large amount of cytoplasm in this foamy, bubbly uh, cytoplasm. In here again, some binucleation, some prominent nucleoli, some polygonal looking cells. They look very polygonal or sometimes oncocytic appearance. Here we have the papillary meshwork, the capillary meshwork, I'm sorry, and it looks like those cells, those epithelial cells are emerging from this uh, meshworks like arborizing or branching from uh, uh, these uh, vessels. And in here, just a uh, detail showing the prominent nucleoli, and in here you can see this greenish, yellowish pigment uh, on the cytoplasm of the cells that you would occasionally uh, see. So, our rose impression was that it was a neoplastic condition, oncocytic, kind of oncocytic or polygonal uh, looking neoplasm. It was highly vascularized, there was prominent nucleoli, and we first thought of a possible metastatic carcinoma. Yes, it's a possibility to the scalp, and it could be also a melanoma. We saw some pigments, it's a scalp lesion. Yes, it's always, it's always possible to be a melanoma. Melanoma should always be in our differentials. Of course, there would be any additional possibilities. For example, an axial tumor could be a tumor of the skin. We have to perform a cell block. Let's go ahead, perform a second pass and save material for cell block. And when we had the cell block, it became very clear to us that we were looking at a very particular entity because here you can see this trabecula of cells and this uh, rich vascularized stroma within this trabecula of cells with the Capillary is very well formed within the groups of cells. So in here you have this polygonal uh, shape cell, sometimes binucleated with very uh, large prominent nucleoli and capillaries within the cells separating these trabeculas. And we performed a series of immunostains, but surely it was very highly positive for hepatocytes. So we concluded as a metastatic hepatocellular carcinoma to the scalp, which is very very rare. There were some uh, reported cases in the literature, but it's a rare event. And additional screening of the patient revealed the liver lesion. So the patient was asymptomatic. He didn't have any liver uh, lesion before. We couldn't. There was any uh, no uh, liver imaging or anything, and it presented itself as a primary metastatic carcinoma. And when we looked at that back and we warned the clinicians, they found the liver lesion, now the patient is being treated for uh, metastatic hepatocellular carcinoma. So hepatocellular carcinoma often have this oncocytic polygonal cell configuration with prominent nucleoli. Uh, the cells are usually arborized or branching from fibrovascular cores. The biliar pigment may be present as it was present in this case. So on the last slide, there was a little bit of this uh, greenish yellowish pigment. Cell blocks were essential in this case for achieving a final proper diagnosis and uh, single metastasis to the scalp is rare, but some cases have been reported. So with Rose in this case, we had a final diagnosis of positive for malignancy consistent with metastatic hepatocellular carcinoma. And without Rose, we would have signed it out as positive for malignancy, epithelioid neoplasm with some oncocytic features, differentiates include melanoma, metastatic carcinoma, or adnexo tumors. So the patient would wouldn't know what he would you know, what he would have. Of course, he would have to remove the lesion, and upon removal of the lesion, he would have to be diagnosed as a metastatic hepatocellular carcinoma. But this would delay uh, his treatment, and of course, uh, it would delay his discovery of the liver lesion. So yes, again, with Rose, we had a definite proper diagnosis using a minimally invasive technique. So in this case, Rose defined the precise diagnosis and helped proper screening of the present of the pre, of the patient upon an unknown mat discovering the primary tumor. In our last case, uh, case number five, it's a male, 46 years old, uh, and he presented with an nodule in the right carotid gland with progressive growth. And this is the image of the nodule. So we had a large uh, chunk of tissue many, many, many cells, and they were clenched in these papillary structures. So in here, you can see the papillary structure. You can even see uh, red blood cells inside the papillary within the, the branching structure of the, the viper, fibrovascular core. Lots of cells hanging from these uh, papillary structures here, uh, some scattered isolated cells. Uh, most of the cells had a bubbly foamy cytoplasm, and they have these hyaline structures 
surrounded by malignant looking or maybe a little bit atypical, atypical cells. Uh, here we have this foamy, bubbly cytoplasm. Some cells are isolated, some cells continue with this branching papillary uh, aspects. Again, this hyaline material that is uh, trapped within the epithelial cells, cytoplasm very bubbly, very foamy, and with a clear cell aspect. Uh, here is the path showing again that some cells had a, even a signed uh, signet ring appearance. Uh, here we again with this branching fibrovascular cores and the cells branching from uh, papillary. So our rose impression was uh, that it was a neoplasm, uh, kindly prominent population of clear cells, papillary features. Uh, it was described or thought of as a clear cell sump according to the Milan system. So it's a neoplasm of undetermined malignant potential. And it could have different differential diagnosis. As mucoepidermoid carcinoma, it's probably a diagnosis. So we thought of mucus inside these uh, cells. A cynic cell carcinoma, they usually present itself as a clear cell neoplasm. We didn't see uh, any zymogene granules that were very characteristic, but yes, it could be a cynic cell carcinoma. Secretary carcinoma, the uh, formerly known neoplasm as mask, as Mariana Long secretary carcinoma, could always be a very, very good option. Uh, we have this branching papillary structures. And polymorphous low-grade adenocarcinoma is another differential. What do we need to do? Perform a cell block. So we went on for the second pass. We put material from aldehyde, and we went for the cell block. Cell block presented the same characteristics as uh, cytology with this branching papillary uh, looking of cells with a foamy evacuated large cytoplasms, some uh, material hyaline structures trapped within the cells that were very characteristic and also we could see this papillary uh, configuration of epithelial cells. It was positive for S100, positive for mammoglobin, positive for adipophilin and diagnosis of uh, Positive for malignancy compatible with secretary carcinoma of the parotid gland. It was formerly known as mask mammary analog secretary carcinoma, and we could give a proper definite diagnosis for this patient, which is not a very straightforward diagnosis to perform. I always remember Dr. Faquin's uh, lecture on the Milan system, and he always lists the diagnoses that are most commonly. Uh, straightforward diagnosed on cytology grounds alone, and mask is not one of them. Secretary carcinoma usually needs immunohistochemistry, and the immunohistochemical panel is very characteristic. And if you're not happy with immunohistochemistry, you always can go for fish with the specific uh, translocation found in these tumors. So, secretary carcinoma, as I said before, it was formerly known as mask. Uh, there is a characteristic immunoprofile, and FISH may detect the specific ETV6 NTR K3 translocation, which is very specific of this entity. And it usually falls within the salivary gland neoplasms of undetermined malignant potential, according to the Milan system, with various differential diagnoses. So it's very important for us to perform a cell block. If we do perform a cell block, we find uh, a final definite diagnosis of secretary carcinoma. So with rose, we had a final diagnosis of secretary carcinoma. Without rose, we would have sent it out as clear cell soon. So again, uh, rose helped us define a new uh, better patient management, a defined diagnosis with appropriate surgical approach of the lesion. So uh, concluding our lecture this morning, morning for me, right? It might be afternoon for you in Europe or even evening for people that might be attending from Asia. ROSE is essential to achieve a proper, definite diagnosis. Uh, it's very important that we rely on our first impression to accurately divide the material and separate material for immunostochemistry, for flow cytometry, for uh, microbiology, for whatever ancillary techniques we need, because that way we can provide a definite, better, precise diagnosis using a minimally invasive method. It is cost effective. Uh, it prevents the patient from coming back, from having a second FNA, from having a core biopsy. Sometimes we do uh, tend to uh, prescribe a core biopsy. So whenever I think uh, clinicians at my hospital, I'm sure that many of you who are attending the, uh, this webinar have the same impression. They don't tend to 
treat lymphomas or accept the first initial diagnosis of lymphoma based only on FNA. So it's usually a core biopsy is needed or surgical removal of the lymph node. So what usually happens is when it's the first uh, analysis of the lymph node, it looks like a lymphoma. I usually ask for a core biopsy and it's totally complementary to the FNA analysis. So we use the FNA material for flow cytometry because it's better suited for flow cytometry. We even use it for molecular if we do need molecular. And we're gonna use the core biopsy for immunohistochemistry and a more refined analysis of the architecture of the lymph node for a final combined diagnosis of lymphoma. Uh, it could be performed on site or remotely with telepathology and that telepathology of course varies from uh, very, uh, high cost uh, techniques to low cost methods that could be applied to any any center. And of course, it usually leads to better patient management with direct impact on therapy and prognosis because you're getting more from less. You are doing a lot from the patient from a minimally invasive method. And this is the basics of cytology. And this is why I fell in love with cytology. And this is why I love practicing cytopathology every day, because I think we are helping the patient by providing a minimally invasive approach, especially patients who are uh, in their advanced stages of disease. Sometimes they are very sick. They, they, don't, they can't stand a more invasive procedure. And through a minimally invasive method, we can get material and we can provide them with all the answers uh, he needs in terms of better therapy, better management, and of course, in the end, a better prognosis. So thank you very much. This is an aerial view of my city, Sao Paulo, in a beautiful uh, winter day. So thank you very much for our attention. I guess I'm open for questions. Thank you. Uh, that that was that was wonderful. Um, I, I wanted to uh, just remind our participants, uh, since uh, you can't speak to the speaker, um, the best way to ask a question is to either use the Q and A box or to um, use the chat box uh, to type in your question, and I will then read it to the speaker. Um, just be sure if you're using the chat box that you're directing it to to me um, or to the general room so that I can actually read it. Um, so I, I, I'll, I'll let the uh, audience take a few minutes to, to find those boxes and type in their questions. And um, Mara, it was funny because you had, I was going to ask you, because um, it, it seems so much like, you know, what drew you to cytopathology, what, what kind of created this enthusiasm in it, because it, it really seemed like, you know, in, in, your, in your speaking that um, this rapid onset evaluation played a major role and you sort of confirmed that for me at, at the end of it. Um, so it, it's, uh, it, it came through in your talk that you have a lot of passion for it. Um, and I imagine it's what a lot of other people, people get drawn into cytopathology for, it's sort of like the, the connection to the patients, you know, you feel like you're connected to the patient. You do, you do. And uh, I think you know, we all pathologists have this detective side very uh, flourished in us that we, we want to we want to detect and make a diagnosis with those tissues. And when we look at the cells, we're even more uh, developing that because we only have parts of cells or some scattered isolated cells that we have to put up the puzzle together to give a proper definite diagnosis. So I think that's very uh, interesting and curious and passionate and also helping the patient by providing, as I said, in the end, a minimally invasive approach. So this is very, uh, this is very interesting, and that's uh, how I, I feel we are helping the patients a lot. Uh, so another question, I just wonder about your, uh, you know, your, your setup and your proportion of uh, how, how often you're, you're performing the FNA on, with on-site versus um, working with a proceduralist um, at, at your institution, because uh, you mentioned, you know, taking core biopsies and, and such. And, at least in our setting, when it, when it comes to possibly needing a core biopsy, we're usually doing that in conjunction with a, a radiologist. Yeah, we do we do it in conjunction with the radiologist. All of our cases, we don't perform FNA ourselves anymore. It's very it's very rare and uncommon for us to perform FNAs. So it's usually ultrasound guided, and the, the radiologist perform the FNA. But we are there together with the radiologist on the ultrasound suite. So we always, as soon as the there is material on the syringe needle, uh, he handles the the needle to us, and we perform the smears. We separate whatever we think that might be appropriate for this week or path. 
uh, we looked at the slides, we divided, and then we uh, get a feedback to the radiologist and we discuss the case with them. And then we manage what is the best appropriate uh, management for that case. But we are together with a radiologist taking care of the patient, but we don't perform the SNEO anymore. Of course, that we guide the radiologist to the areas that we think that might be more appropriate or less appropriate for obtaining material, because since we are pathologists, we do have this tendency of gross analysis of tissues and nodules. So when we look at a nodule, we know that it's if it's necrotic, if it's not, if we're getting material or not. So we guide the radiologist what's the best area that we want to have material collected, but we don't perform the FNA. And as for the questions about, uh, I don't know if I understand it right, but as for the a, a percentage of cases that we do perform rows, we tend to perform rows now for 100% of our samples. So we, we don't perform roles if it's something very extraordinary. For example, if there's a five needle aspiration clinic sometimes on Saturdays and there's nobody here, uh, or if it's late in the evening and they usually put it on thin prep and they don't perform the smear. But basically, I would say that 99% of our samples we perform rapid on site evaluation. Well, that, yeah, that's great. We uh, do, we're very similar with regards to working with um, proceduralists and, and radiologists. I think it depends on the, the institution and the, the resources and the workflow. But um, for us, you know, a lot of these, these there's a trend towards having a lot of these lesions detected um, incidentally more, more frequently now with the power of, of imaging studies. And, and therefore, they, they become much more um, difficult to, to reach without a, ultrasound guidance and it, it, it creates kind of a nice yeah. workflow um, for all the patients kind of going through the same sort of uh, workflow uh, for efficiency. Okay, well, I, I see, my, uh, Chris, I see, okay. I see one question. I see one question from uh, uh, from my great friend, uh, Luna Luciano from Spain, that she put it here that your cell blocks are uh, really good and wanted to know which method you use. So we use histogel Lola, for the cell blocks. So we, uh, first of all, well, if you read the, the histogel protocol, they tell you to uh, fix the material in uh, alcohol and then you process it for uh, the histogel. But then we, uh, as we were fixing material in the alcohol, we had some issues with immunospechemistry because all of our immunospechemistry was aligned with a uh, formally fixed paraffin embedded material. So we switch it to, from uh, alcohol to uh, formaldehyde and now we have better results. So we fix everything in formaldehyde and then we process the cell blocks using histogel. And we usually performed an additional second pass just for the cell blocks. Even if there's too much material in the first class, I usually perform a second pass specifically for cell blocks because I wanted to make sure that I have material for immunostochemistry because it's very frustrating for us to have a lesion that we want to study, we want to uh, perform immunostochemistry when, when the cell blocks are, comes in, we don't have enough material. And then we have to ask for the patient to come back or even ask for uh, a core biopsy. So that's a very frustrating experience for us. So it's usually uh, I usually perform a second FNA with uh, uh, exclusively for the production of the cell block. Great, thank you. I'm glad you caught that question. Um, so I, I, again, I really appreciate it. It was a wonderful talk, great, great photographs. Um, and if anyone missed it or came in a little bit late, it will be um, archived within the next day or two on uh, through the uh, IAC website. Um, so uh, thank you again, Mara. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Thanks to all the, the participants. See you. Thank you.